before we, we delve into the mighty word of God, praise the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just bless you and we thank you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We, just, we love being in the presence of your sweet spirit. Lord, just the, the, the pleasantness of coming together with brothers and sisters and Lord, worship you. There's just nothing like that. And Father, we just ask your, your anointing to just fall and for ears to hear what the, the Spirit is saying to the church, Lord, through your word, not man's. And Father, we just ask for revelation and wisdom and knowledge and understanding as, as we speak on what you had us, um, let it lead us to speak today. And we just bless you, Father. We thank you. We bless you for this sacrifice of your Son that washed us clean. Father, we thank you that your Son fulfilled those sacrifices of sin and death, Lord on that cross, and we just bless you, and we thank you, Father, for that. And we just bless you. Baruch HaBab Hashem Amen. So we, we actually had a different sermon planned. Mm -hmm. And Laura said, nope. <laughs> I hate it when that happens, because it tells me just how far we have to go to really hear from him. It's like... I know God didn't change his mind. He knew mm. the whole time what he was doing. Apparently, we just didn't. Because remember this, man's plans, garbage cans. Okay? <laughs> man's plans, garbage cans. So, <laughs> uh, if, you'll op if you'll pull out your sword and go to Genesis 3. Uh, unsheath it from its scabbard. Unsheath it from its scabbard. And, and you're going to see a confirmation of, of, of what Brother Bobby spoke, what but our brother here spoke, um, and especially with what you said, there's something coming. And we're going to share that with you. It's going to get you fired up. You're not going to leave here the same. And we really appreciate the word that you gave us. We really, really do. He's been telling us this over and over again. And every time I hear it, just, I mean, I, I know that it's coming, but every time I hear it, the gravity of the honor of that is staggering. And, and I'm, I wanted to give you a word of encouragement. Um, the Lord will bring you in due season to that heart's call. Because that, that call, that's not your desire. That's a desire he's put in you. And for a while, Joseph and I felt like that too. And we were saying, why are we dealing with skin issues? Issues. Surface, mm. surface issues. We want to deal with matters of the heart. Mm -hmm. and, and he's calling his road warriors out. The ones who are going to go from the church, outside of the church, and be out in the streets because time is short. And he was basically showing us, though, that while we were yearning for that, he's like, you're not quite ready yet. You're not quite ready yet. And what he was showing me when, when you were talking was when he ripens the fruit on the vine, that you're in the ripening process. And then in order for you to have your full nutrient content, in order for you to have all those vitamins and minerals that you need to be able to nourish everybody, he needs to keep you on the vine until the perfect moment to pick you. And so when he's ripening us, you know, we feel, it, you can look at a fruit and sometimes it doesn't look a whole lot different from the time it's grown to full size versus actually ripened. And so he's, he's showing, you know, you're, you're like, I feel full, I feel full, I feel the size that a, a mature fruit is. And he's like, just wait, sit in the sun. Sit in the sun, be still and know that I am Yah. And so I pray that that ripening would occur and he knows just the right moment to pick you so that those who you will go to will be nourished the way they need to be nourished and they'll be satiated with his fruit in you. So we're, we're going to talk about heavenly gates. But before we talk about heavenly gates, we need to know what our gates are. All right, so we'll start at Genesis 3. And this... Oops. Did, does anybody know Dr. Fuchsia Pickett? Did, did anybody know who she was? She was a powerhouse preacher. Um, 
well known. She was um, my pastor when I was young. She was such a humble woman, I didn't even know she was world famous. And I just knew her as Sister Pickett. But she used to talk about gateways a lot. And the, the school I went to when I was young was called Gateway Christian Academy. And her church was called Fountain Gate. And she always used to talk about gates. And it, the Lord is resurrecting that uh, message in my spirit. And bringing back to memory sermons that happened decades ago where she's talking about that. And this is a season of very great importance in the matter of gateways. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the Lord has changed our, ta our, our talk about. So we'll start right there at the top of the, the verse. Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animal which Adonai, God, had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you're not to eat from any tree in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the tree of the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you're neither to eat from it nor touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, it is, it is not true that you will surely die, because God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had pleasing appearance, and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loincloths. One of the first things I, I, I want to point out here is women have gotten a bad rap in being blamed for the fall of man. But what my Bible says and what your Bible says is that Adam was right there with her. He could have stopped this from happening by being her proper covering and being her proper head. This is why Yeshua, this is why it says in Romans that, that Jesus came as a man because sin entered the world through man, not through woman. So could Adam have stopped what had happened? Yes. You know, and that, and that's, that's for the husbands here. We are, we are the covering of our wives. We're their head, and our head is the Messiah. And if we put anybody between us and the Messiah, we dishonor our head as far as men. But if she does something wrong, if she messes up or, or something, I can come in and stand in the gap. As proper head, as proper head of the house, as the high priest of the home, and cover her. I'm just gonna be honest. I used to hate this whole thing of the man is the head. I mean, is there? Am I talking to anybody out there but me? Can anybody <laughs> confess their sin but me? I was, I, I was raised by a very strong man and a very strong woman. I was reared by them, and we, there were three of us girls. And my father taught us that anything he can do, you can do better. <laughs> and it's not that he was, it's not that they were feminists, but they were strong people and they wanted us to be strong. And so I was very, I was a feminist, I, I would say, for a while. And then the Lord got appropriateness into my spirit. And I started saying, I, I was wrestling with him. I mean, who of us has been Jacob before wrestling with the Lord about something? And it's not that we're trying to be rebellious, it's that we don't, it doesn't make sense to us. But I have embraced that because I can't, I can't be responsible for everything. I can't do it all. And that's not my place to. The Father is the one that deserves that glory. But what if we make a commitment to pray for somebody and I go to my husband and I say, oh my goodness, I forgot. I told this person I'd be praying for them. He says to me, don't worry, honey, I did that last night. I got you covered. And so that role fulfillment together, we, two is better than one. One can forget and the other one can remember. And our word together is still bonded and unbroken to that person. And so sometimes I need, I need the Lord to, to speak through him because I'm not sure. And I've begun to take a nice just exhale and breathe because he has given me a head that, uh, that does not dishonor me. You know, the head is not made to go and bite the body. 
And, and so when we learn how to interact together in appropriateness, then it's a beautiful thing. And it's not demeaning. I also want to I also want to show you if you go back to chapter two we weren't planning on this the Lord's just impressing upon me to show you this in chapter two of Genesis two starting with verse fifteen this is also very crucial in in us tearing down these doctrinal strongholds that have been very misogynistic women hating in the church and that's that when God created Adam God gave Adam the instructions he didn't tell Eve which again that fell on Adam. If you, if you read here, it was after God told Adam, don't eat of the tree. After that was when he created Eve. And then there they are together. And Eve takes of the fruit. Right? So he failed in being the proper head. He failed and he received a word from the Lord. And he didn't tell his wife. Or if he did, she, there he is in, in chapter 3. Serpent is talking to her, feeding into her ears, mm -hmm. and he didn't step in and say, whoa, 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 that's not exactly what he said. No, he didn't say that if we touch it, we would die. Okay. So, Boom. and the other thing about that is that why did, you know, another possibility of why sin entered through man is because what did Creator tell Adam to do? He said, tend and keep the garden. That word keep is shamar, and it means to hedge about and protect. So how did that snake get in there? Again, how Adam must have not been doing what he, what he was told. That boundary. Because that snake got in the boundary. That boundary was broken. And, speak, and so we're going we're gonna to cover here in chapter 3, five gates. We encourage you to write this down, take notes, that way you can study. So the first gate, you want to read that one? So this, I think this can probably happen in different orders. Mm -hmm. I don't think it always has to be this way, but in this circumstance, the first gateway that was broached in Eve was the ear gate. He sewed words into her ears that were just slightly off. He didn't come and say something completely crazy different. He came and, and said, almost exactly right, but not. I mean, imagine being in an airplane, and you could just get one degree off on your course. By the time you get to the, your end destination, you're way over here, and far away from where the original course was planned. And you know, there's been many times, and scientific studies have been done, and, and this and that about women, and, and the ears. You know, like she, like, I, like she could be angry at me and all get out about something stupid that I did. But I start talking sweetness into her ears and loving words. And she's like, oh. <laughs> Satan knew where to attack. The, the women was through the ears, through the ear gate. The next gate is the mind gate. Also, the logic gate is another way to put that. Because after, after he sewed into her ears, he reasoned quote-unquote, reasoned with her. Oh, God just doesn't want you to be like him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want you to have this knowledge. What, what is so big about, what's the big deal about having that knowledge? That, that knowing is, is more like an experiential knowledge, okay? All they knew was good in the garden. And when they took that fruit, all of a sudden, they understood and knew bad, too. And experiential is experience. It's knowledge that you gain from experiencing. You know, just like knowledge that you gain from walking with the Lord or from worshiping the Lord and feeling His presence or giving a word of prophecy. That's experiential knowledge. It's knowledge that you're receiving as you're walking out your faith. And so all God wanted us to ever know was good. His goodness, goodness, goodness. And instead we had to go and and allow deception to occur in us so that we began to also experience bad. Now let's look at verse 6, and you all tell me what gate this is. I'll read it. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had a pleasing appearance, what gate was that? The eyes. The eye gate. So the Guys, gentlemen, the women is the ears. With men, it's our eyes. What do we, how do we look? What did, what did Job make, make a good covenant? He made a covenant with his eyes uh, concerning looking at women with lust. You know, that, that's our, our downfall is our eye gate. 
with men. All right? Keep That's that always guarded. what Dr. Pickett told us too. That the ear gate is the the suscept most susceptible part of the woman, and the the eye gate with men. Nobody oh, actually thought that. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I didn't tell you that. All right. So if we keep going there in six, uh, da, 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 and, and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. What gate is that? She took her hands touch. So she touched first, and then it was the taste, the mouth gate. What does the Father tell us to do? To taste and see that the Lord is good. Not to be tasting of something he, we're not supposed to be even touching. Although he didn't say touch. He said not to eat of it. But what, you know, it's, it's like, what do you, are you going to really put that temptation, yourself subject it under that temptation by touching it? You know, we do need to avoid it. It also speaks of appropriateness, too. You know, we, we've been places where we've seen absolutely inappropriate behavior. You know, from leaders and pastors laying hands on women in places where they don't need to be laying hands on. You know, and it's like this is inappropriate for men. That's the hand gate. You know, be careful who you're laying hands on. Don't lay hands suddenly upon somebody. You know, it, it, there, there's so many scriptures that you find about that touching, that appropriateness. And so there's, there's that hand gate. And I encourage you um, to, to be respectful in the way that we go about even hugging people. Because um, even women, hugging women, you never know if that person has struggled with something. And so being, you know, the scripture tells us to greet each other with a holy kiss, you know, which would be something like this. You know? Um, but... You see today full body hugs that are, you know, activating gateways or being triggers for people that may cause them to accidentally be mm -hmm. faced with temptation or thoughts that they're trying to avoid. And that hand gate is really a flesh gate. I mean, it's not just hands, it's just all our, all of our flesh. Uh, and then the last one is the mouth, the mouth gate. So we have five gates. So when we think about these gateways, it's not just us that has gateways, but you know what, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on. Slow my roll. Let's go to uh, Psalm 24. Mm -hmm. You know, we, are, we have gates, but we are gates. Okay? Psalm 24, starting in verse 7. Who wants to read that? Somebody, Let's somebody go all the way through 10. Some, 7 through 10. Will someone read that one? Yeah, here I got it here. Psalm 24, 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Amen. And who is the King of all kings? Mm -hmm. The right. Messiah, Yeshua. And so, when we were saved, what happened to us? Yeshua came into us. Into our hearts, right? So, we are these gates. This is a foreshadowing of salvation here. Telling us, Lift up your heads, O you gates. So you are a gateway in the spirit world, in the spiritual. You are a gateway. You can be a gateway for either good or, now that we have eaten the fruit, you can be a gateway for bad, evil. It's your choice. And what does Scripture tell us? It tells us not that, that both sweet and bitter water can't come from the same fountain. So... We can't at the same time be gushing that forth. We need to make a decision and we need to be strong in it to not allow that bitter... What, what, give us an example of what that bitter water might be. Yeah. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. Murmuring and complaining. Yes. Yeah, murmuring and complaining. Murmuring and complaining. Gossiping. 
But let's, let's tell you this, this quick story about the murmuring and complaining, and, and or just I'm going to share it real quick about Florida. Uh, we were we were young in, in ministry, still young in ministry, and the Lord had had brought us to a missionaries conference, and that very complaining, the, the the pastor came up and he's like, "We want you to give the word tomorrow," you know. And this is a big missionaries conference. All I heard Father was one of the speakers. And so we're sitting there in the bed, and I'm sitting there looking, and I'm, I'm like, Lord, I don't know what you want me to talk on. What's the word that you wanted me to give? And he gave me these verses, and she had her Bible, and I said, "Huh? will you look up Exodus? I can't remember the verse now. And she looked at me, and she goes, I'm glad you're giving this word. Because <laughs> she usually gives the hard words. And right out, the, right, out the, right out of the scriptures, it starts off, you evil congregation. Wow. You have complained and grumbled, and it has reached my ears. Therefore, I'm going to do it to you. And I was like, oh, I gotta give that, you know. And so, but then he gave me another verse about repenting. You know, God, never, God always said He'll always give you people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and anger, and that's not true. God doesn't change. But all throughout the Old Testament, He's telling us, look, this is this, 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 this is wrong. But if, or if you repent, if you turn back to Me, then He goes into all the blessings that He's going to give you. So. We gave that, it was praise and worshiping, everybody was just smiling and laughing and loving life and loving the Lord, and they brought us up, and I gave that word, and every smile dropped. I mean, it was like a lead balloon. But then, you know, the Holy Spirit took over, and we started talking, and there was a call for repentance, and then we see the pastor and the elders, after we were done, come walking up to us. And I looked at her, and I said, here we go, we're about to get kicked out. Just like Jesus said, here we go. And they, they were in tears. And they said, we were going to have a meeting tonight, and we were going to split the church and have a church divorce. Wow. And he goes, instead, we're going to still have that meeting, but we're going to get on our faces before God and repent. Wow. And, and so don't, I'm saying all that to, one, watch the words that come out of your mouth. Because words have power. You know, if you're going to speak words, let them be sweet words that, that come up. Because you never know how that's affecting the people in the congregation. How that's stunting the growth of, of a brother and sister who needs you know, that edification and that encouragement. We had no idea they were going to split this church. You know, God doesn't want that. He wants a unified body. Jesus isn't coming back for a dismembered bride in pieces. He's coming back for one bride. And we need to get on the same pages. Amen? So. Not only that, but the scripture, there's a scripture that talks about divisiveness that says warn a man one time and then kick him out. And so... That's not three strikes, you're out, guys. That's wow. If we're speaking words that could be divisive, we can get in major trouble. We're working, when we do that, we're working to undo Yeshua's last prayer over us, which was unity, unity, unity. Over and over he goes on in John 17 about it. And look what Satan did. He created denominations. Denominations in Latin means to divide the nations. Doesn't even hide it. You know, which, which praise the Lord when, when Jesus comes back, there's none of that. We're all going to be worshiping before the throne of the Lamb. It's not going to be men's doctrines or traditions uh, as a part of that. And a lot of times in churches this size, it's not an issue, but when growth hits, that's when it begins. Mm. And so if you guys have been praying for the Lord to increase the tent pegs of this establishment and bring people in, Make sure that you're praying that he'll only bring those that he wants here. It's not about the numbers. It's about quality over quantity. And so um, just be on guard for that. So now go to Numbers 6, verse 24 through 26. And the reason we have this in here is to tie it in with that Psalm 24. Because here he's saying, lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up. Why do we need to lift them up? What, what is it that has to do with the lifting of the face? Okay. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and show you his favor. May his lift up his face upon you and give you peace. May Adonai lift up his face upon you. Okay, so um, there... When it says, may he make his face to shine upon you and show you favor. I don't know if you've ever done a study on favor, 
But favor is when God turns his face to you. In native culture, when native people turn their back on you, it is a huge insult. They have just shunned you and told you that not only does your word have no value, but you as a person are somebody they wish did not exist in this world. And so it's, it's not like, please don't misinterpret if we happen to be facing the wrong way. You know if somebody has turned their back on you. Mm -hmm. It's clear. It's not just a positional matter. <laughs> um, but when, when God, and, and he'll talk about setting his face against us. Against, okay? Turning it. Contrary to. Mm -hmm. Instead of panim al panim, face to face. Which this that's how it was when Adam was created. It says in scripture, Panima face to face breathed life into Adam. It's a very intimate picture of being close to the Father. And so after his face, making his face to shine upon you and show you favor, um, may he lift up his face towards you. And that lifting up, there's, the other way to say it is lift up your count, his countenance upon you. And what does that mean? If somebody has a long face, then they're frowning, right? But if your countenance is lifted, he's smiling upon you. He's smiling upon you. And so when we are dejected and when we're down and when we're trodden over and when we're concentrating on ourselves and our problems, where is our head? It's down. It's Have you ever seen people, pictures of, of athletes when they're defeated? What are they doing? They're like this, or like this. But when they're victorious, they're lifting up their face. And so when we can take our thoughts and our minds and go from concentrating on our troubles, on our problems, and ourselves, and lift them up, I will look unto the hills from whence my help comes from. And so, when we lift it up to Him, we are concentrating our attentions on Him instead of on the problems. And when we do that, things start falling in place. Things start falling in place because He's going, that's all I wanted is for you to turn your attention to me. Sometimes and, and there you're to, using all your gates hmm. to worship Him, your eye gate, your everything, giving everything to Him. Your mouth, yeah. your hands, touching, reaching out to touch the heart of God. And, you know, all the, sometimes he has to create the storm so that we cry out for him. Or sometimes he has to allow the storm, the enemy, to, to uh, come in, step in. Sometimes we create our own storms. <laughs> Don't always blame say. the devil for the problems in your life. Yeah. Because sometimes God will bring testing. And sometimes it's just things that we've done. And a lot of times it's because of words that have been spoken. You know, I mean, there's a scripture that, uh, what is it, a fool's, a fool's, invite, yeah, a fool's mouth invites a beating. There's that, there's that mouth gate. You know, and, and, uh, and we see that happen all the time, <laughs> unfortunately. So when, we, when we're lifting up our head to him, um, we're opening that gate. You know, we're opening that gate. We're, we're focusing on him. And so he can flow through our situations there. He can move in our lives because we're not... And we, when we do it, we need to be... It's, it's really hard to get our, our eyes off our situation, I know. But if we can just make our motivations pure and going to him... One of the things the Lord impressed upon me yesterday is, is that people... Um, when we were ministering yesterday, is that people will come to God like trying to get closer to Him because they need Him. They recognize the need for Him to act in their lives. They're in trouble. They need help. And they know that they should turn to God for help. But what they're doing is they're getting close to Him, getting close to Him because they want to pick His pocket. They want to know what's in His hands instead of like, hey, yeah. Yeah. Just, what can I get from you? I need you. I need you. You said that you'd provide for me, right? Is it in this pocket, Daddy? 
Is it in this pocket? If, if I do this thing, thing, will you bless me if I do this thing? <laughs> God's not some cheap magician wizard, you know, with, with a hat full of tricks. And he may own the cattle on a thousand hills, but he's not the ATM machine that you can go to and punch in the right numbers and put out the money. Um, what have you invested into that bank? Are you looking at him being just the one who sustains your heart? Because when we go to him for that, he's going to sustain everything else. He's going he's gonna to do it. What, he's going to give you what you need. So we are, we may not look at it because we, we had a 10 hour Holy Spirit led service yesterday. <laughs> it was incredible. It started and then it just went and went and went and went and went. Very powerful. Uh, but there is something big that's coming. And I'm going to show this short video first and then we'll, we're going to explain what's happening. Watch out, I need the microphone. show you this video but we are going to be going to Los Angeles California you know we're moving next month to Minnesota next month, two weeks okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> honey just let me live in my world of illusion please <laughs> um, Even though we're moving in a couple of weeks and we're supposed to be unpacking during April and getting things set up, the Lord told us to go to Los Angeles. Basically, we're going to Minnesota and we're dropping our stuff off in a house that we've never seen before. And then we're getting on a plane and flying to Los Angeles for two weeks because the Lord has something for us to do out there. And I'm really, really excited about it. I've not been excited about... I, I'm not a person that's very excitable. <laughs> I mean, when the Lord stirs me, yes, but I'm more of a calm person. It comes from years of working in the emergency room and trying to get everybody else to calm down. <laughs> but he's gotten me excited about this. I am a red man. If the Great Spirit had desired me to be a white man, he would have made me so in the first place. God made me an Indian, sitting boy, 1867. First Nations people have been given a message, have awakened to righteousness. A new way has come. Upon suffering beyond suffering, the red nation shall rise again, and there shall be a blessing for a sick world. The crazy horse said that in 1877. In the midst of diversity, there will be unity. In the midst of suffering, there will be healing. There will be restoration. Native American has been a sleeping giant, he's awakening. The original Americans will become the next evangelist who will help win America for Christ. Billy Graham made that prophecy 40 years ago. The sleeping giant is no longer asleep. It is moving. It is moving. And I challenge every tribe, rise. The rise shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has rises upon you. We're going to leave. Jewish people were put on reservations, and today. 
way that American Indians are still on reservation. And I believe what we've seen in the book of Exodus is going to take place right before our eyes here in America. I believe that the Native American people are the key to a tremendous move of God, a revival that's getting ready to sweep the earth. It is Kairos time for us, and I'm seizing that moment. I'm seizing this time. We feel a sense of urgency to depart with kingdom shakers up on the reservation of people who are not willing to to settle with what history said, but are willing to really pursue what destiny says. So God is going to use us, and there is going to be a change, and it's going to start from us. God is getting ready to do something very powerful in America. God's getting ready to move a powerful, powerful move like we have never, ever seen before. Never. authority to break the darkness of witchcraft to control over America more than we can ever think or imagine what God wants to do. Korean and Chinese Christians are now connected with Native America. For God has spoken. I have now turned my faith to the host people of the land for blood cries from the ground. Now is our time, people. Now is our time. Exciting or what? <laughs> so, th through we, we just came across, you know, Billy Graham made that prophecy in 1975. Oh, Billy Graham made that prophecy in 1975. That was, uh, for, it's been 41 years now. But, you know, there's that time, there's that 40, that time in the wilderness. According to the biblical calendar, the Lord was showing me it's still 40. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. So, <laughs> So, you know, we, the Lord, when he first brought us to Murphy, North Carolina, we're like, God, why this place? Why Murphy? You know, we, we knew nothing about the place, knew nothing about it, uh, even though uh, some of her ancestral land that her family lived on uh, is there in Murphy, actually in Hanging Dog area. And so for, we've been there for six years, and we're like, God, what, what do you want to do with this place? Well, in Murphy, has anybody been to Field of the Woods there? Okay, you've been there. Uh, of course you've been there. <laughs> Field of the Woods is, in 1896, there were Methodists and Baptists uh, who came together, and they just started crying out for more of God. This said, was at Shearer Schoolhouse? Yet, no, it moved to Shearer. Okay. First, it was, at a, uh, it was like a little factory, and there, they just came together, just a little prayer meeting, and the Holy Spirit dropped on this place. And then from there, it got so big that then they moved it to the Shearer Schoolhouse. There was a little um, school that was there probably about two miles away from the first spot. And we were talking miraculous healing. You know, uh, people come out of wheelchairs, the blind scene. I mean, absolutely power of God moving at, at this place. And interestingly enough, in the Cherokee language, that land is called Talakwa, which means the place where heaven meets earth. And, and, and it's a heavenly gate there. That movement of the Holy Spirit there birthed the Church of God. Right? So this was 10 years before Azusa. Now, somebody from, um, and we just learned this part, there were people who were at that revival in Murphy, North Carolina, who went over oh, okay. to Los Angeles, and um, they went over to Los Angeles, and they were at the Azusa Street Revival in 1906. Now, in 1906... Uh, in 1906, Azusa. Azusa in the native language means blessed miracle. It also means sweet water, and it means light dispelling darkness. And that's in the Tongva language of the native people of that land. So we were looking at that, and, and, we, and we heard uh, a call for 120 First Nations to come to Azusa this year. Tell them what the area of Los Angeles in the native tongue oh, yeah, translates the, to. That land, I, I can't pronounce it in their language. Uh, but the land translates into Village of Yah, mm -hmm. was the traditional name of the land where Los Angeles is. And, and for anybody here who's saying hallelujah, uh, who's, who's saying who's Yah, when you say hallelujah, you're saying praise Yah. It's one of, it's his nickname. So, so we, we heard this call for, for the 120 nations to go and God was like, you need to be there. 
And so Marlon started looking up, you know, we teach on the biblical calendar and the appointed times. Everywhere throughout scripture, and even in today's world, there are things that happen on God's appointed times. These are times where these things have been set to take place. For example, May 14, 1948, Israel becomes a nation, fulfilling biblical prophecy. That happened on Shavuot, an appointed time, Pentecost. Right? Uh, September 11th, when the, when the Twin Towers were hit, that was on an appointed time. It was the Feast of Trumpets, right? which, is, which is a day when you're supposed to sound the alarm, sound Say, the warning. Wake up. Saying, wake, wake up. up. So we have appointed times all throughout Scripture. And so Laurelin, the Lord led her to look up, well, what happened in the first revival back in 1906, according to Scripture? So, well, let's back up just a second. Um, <laughs> the, what he's, you mix two things together. So what, what he's talking about was the Lord had asked, had, had led me to look up the very first day, the first revival of Azusa Street, the date, what was it? And so... April 9th, 1906. That date on the biblical calendar, according to the lunar and agricultural calendar that's laid that out in scripture, um, that he tells us how that's how we're to reckon our time. That's how he reckons time. I looked it up, and it was era of Pesach, that's which the, is the beginning of Passover. And that's an appointed time. The appointed times in scripture are times where God promises to encounter his people. It's something that, that the church has been robbed from, thanks to Constantine back in 345 uh, AD. But this is re being restored back to the bride now. And so then, then she was led to look up, well, what's going on at Azusa this year, April 9th, 2016? So they had it on um, April 9th. Well, actually, let me back up just a second because they said they didn't just choose to have a revival on the on what is the 110th anniversary. Y'all pace him with me, because I know this is a little distracting, but they didn't just choose to have a revival on the 110th anniversary of Azusa Street, okay? This is what happened. Lou Engle had a dream, and in the dream, the Lord told him, 1,080 days from today, I, I'm going to pour out my spirit in a revival. And so he got up and he counted 1,080 days. 1,080 days was April 9th, 2016. And then somebody, he told some people about his dream. And then somebody else called and said, the Lord gave them a dream that they were supposed to have this revival meeting at a place, she said she saw a stadium in her dream and that it was used for both baseball and football. And so she went on Google, of course, and found that the only stadium in the, all of America that is used for both football and baseball is the Coliseum in Los Angeles. Guess where Azusa Street is, guys? And guess what date that was? The 110th anniversary of Azusa. And so people who don't have not learned about the feasts of the Lord and the appointed times. We're being times. led by the Holy Spirit. Which We're still leads being you in the led. Truth. Yes, yeah. being led. And so when I, um, I thought, you know, the Lord's not just going to randomly choose that day. If He's going to pour out His Spirit, you know, He can do it whenever He wants. But if it's really going to be big enough that we're supposed to go out there, there's going to be some something more to it. And so I looked up, and on this. April 9th, 2016, is Aviv 1, which is the spiritual new year, the biblical new year. You know, we all celebrate, you know, people usually celebrate new year on January 1st. This is January 1st version of God. And what happened, I, I was like, okay, what happened in biblical history on that day? What did he do before on Aviv 1, Exodus 40. He established the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness. He commanded Moses on that day, bring in the ark. On that day, bring in the candlestick, the menorah, and light it. On that day, bring in the priests with their garments and anoint them with oil. His spirit came on that 
day. And from that day on, tabernacled amongst them and was there a cloud by day and a fire by night. Mm. That was the day that he... Was it appointed time? Yes, yeah. that appointed time. It was also the new moon. Um, this year, it's also going to be a, a solar eclipse on that day. And there's more. So not only is, is so we have the establishment of the tabernacle, we've got the, the light of the world coming into the tabernacle, the priests are being anointed, there's going to be a solar eclipse, it's the very beginning of the biblical new year. Smith Wigglesworth made a prophecy. And he said, and I can't remember the exact date when he made the prophecy, but he said 110 years from, from when he spoke his prophecy, which, is, which I, I, I'm no, bad at numbers. No, it was 110 years from his Azusa. Oh, that's right. Smith Wigglesworth made a prophecy, and he said 110 years from the Azusa revival is going to be when the greatest revival that's ever going to take place, the Great Awakening, is going to happen. Now, this was a, he spoke this before, and here we are 110 years later on this appointed time that God's leading people from everywhere, and you want to talk about redemption, the, the, the place seats 100,000 people. There's going to be 100,000 believers across denominations coming to worship the Lord. And Unity. the Colosseum is what Rome used to persecute and kill Christians from the first to fourth century. Talk about, talk about flipping that and bringing life. You should watch one day Perry Stone's teaching on the comparison between modern day the, America and Rome. It is staggering. We won't go through all of it right now, but America is the modern day Roman Empire. And here in the old Roman Empire, the Colosseum was used to slaughter and martyr Christians. And here you see the dead revived. What's going to happen at this Colosseum in this modern day Rome. And they called for it's 120 the resurrection, tribes. the resurrection, the resurrection of, of us, the revival. And so they called for 120 nations. Well, remember 10 years before Azusa, right here in Murphy, was the first documented outpouring. And that makes it 120 years. So they're, they're doing all these things just led by the Holy Spirit without realizing the depths of what's taking place. So we're, we're going to go out to Azusa for that, but if you cannot go to California, there's going to be a gathering here on April 9th, 2016, and it's just people coming from across denominations just to gather at this heavenly gate and just, uh -huh. it's, it's going to be in Murphy, in Murphy area, area. And, and I can give you all, uh, you can Facebook me or, or I can send you the Facebook event page for the, we, we saw the couple last night and we prayed over them and blessed them. Uh, for what they're going to do here because the Lord's told them we need to spearhead this and just invite everybody who wants to come to meet on his appointed time and, and the, God's appointed times you know we, we a lot of times we're taught well these are the festivals of the Jews these this is the Sabbath of the Jews well God created the Sabbath before he even gave the law he created the Sabbath before any of that right so before there was ever a race of people called Jews the festivals of the Lord are his appointments with his people so it, it's like you have a date with God you got date night, and you don't show up. Right? These are times all throughout Scripture significantly. Whenever you see a date where it says, on Nisan 1, da 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 happened. On this date, I guarantee you it was an appointed time. And you, and you can look them up. The, de the, the birth of the Messiah, the resurrection, the burial, the resurrection, his, his return, judgment day, and the millennial reign are all spelled out in the Feast of the Lord. Every single one of them. And he's fulfilled the spring feast, and we're waiting for him to fulfill the, the fall feast, which is when he returns. So the Father laid it on our hearts to call forth to people that if they can't be at the Azusa revival, he actually he wants to dig up wells, the, mm -hmm. the old wells from all over this nation. This one that you guys are close to is a really important one because I believe that's the one that lit the Azusa revival. And there's every evidence to think that it is. But there are wells of revival all over the place. The Lord's told me there's one in Washington, D.C. And somebody told me that they're familiar with that well, that it is the case. He gave me a Lexington, dream about it. Kentucky was the other one? There's one in Lexington, Kentucky. There's one in Dunn, North Carolina. There are people coming from great distances to come to these wells because 
The Lord has told us that this is something he desires to do, is to dig up the old wells. What happened to Isaac? He went and tried to dig wells. He dug wells, went through all this effort in the wilderness. And what did the enemy do? The Philistines came in, dumped sand in it, dumped garbage in it, stopped it up. And that's every time that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to come and drown, or to bury, to bury our well, just like he wants to bury us. Bury it, bury it. But he, the Father is ready to burst those wells out. It is time. Those gateways, those are gateways, and this is what ties into the gateways that we were talking about earlier. Remember Jacob in his dream? Right? In, in the fourth watch, the angels ascend. That was another gate. Angels ascending and descending. So this, these gateways, these places of revival are gateways for, for the spirit world. And they're either under the watch of the kingdom of light, or they're under the watch of the kingdom of darkness. And even NASA has to use these heavenly gates for when they do their, their um, photographies and their videographies. So when, when we go in and pray that those wells of revival will be dug up, we, it's imperative that we, that we finish that task because right now, if it's stopped up, it can only be used by the enemy. It's our job to get in there and pray that, that bursting forth. And how do we do that? Second Chronicles 7.14, say it with me. If my people who are called, who are called by, by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, Ask and for forgiveness. One. And yes, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them, and I will, I will forgive. forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And Father, that's what we want. And by the way, that verse was spoken on an appointed time, at the very last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, was when that was spoken. And by the way, why do you think there's so many, why do you think there's so much healing that goes on at revivals? If he says he's going to heal the land, what are we made of? We're dirt. We are made of the earth. When he's going to heal the land, he's going to heal this land that he breathed his life into. If you're praying for healing, pray first for revival. Pray first for his spirit to come and take you over and remake you. That revive. I mean, think about just the word revival. It's, it's new life. Life restore. again, res restoration of life. That's what healing is. So, so the Lord has brought us to the Murphy Gate, and now he's sending us over to the Azusa Gate. And two years ago, we had started, uh, we were asked to come down to uh, Glory Way Ministries down in Bradenton, Florida. This is Gerald Durstein and Miss Beulah Durstein, which uh, she just passed away yesterday morning. And they... They were a, a just sweet Mennonite couple from Pennsylvania who had a vision of converting the Indians to become Mennonites. Uh, that, was, that was what they thought. And so his uncle had a ministry on the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota. And, and, he, and his uncle said, hey, why don't you come and, and come up here and just minister and help us do outreaches to the Indians. And so they get there and it's a 40 acre retreat center, cabins on the lake, sanctuaries, got hotel rooms, uh, RV camp, I mean, everything but all that to say that when when they started getting together, because in the Mennonite church, they don't read the book of Acts. Well, they, say, they, don't, they don't think it's for today. They, they say, that's not for today. That was then. The Holy Spirit stuff was then. That's not now. And so they're a bunch of young, you know, young teenagers, and they're sitting there reading this, and they're like, we need this. Why aren't we operating in this? And, and so they started just getting together and just praying and said, Lord, I, we, we want this Holy Spirit. Whatever this, whatever this is that you're saying in your word, we want it. And the Holy Spirit dropped. And from that ministry, I mean, millions and millions of people global have come to the Lord through their ministry. And there's a gate. They, they are credited in Christian history with being the founders of the charismatic movement in Christianity. Uh, why? There is an open heavens on this property as well. I mean, miracles upon miracles and deliverance. I mean, the same thing that you hear happen at Azusa, the same things that you hear hap that happen in Murphy also happened up here. And... You know, he's 88 years old now, and he'd been praying, Lord, what do I do with this property? What do I do with the place? You know, I'm, I'm in my twilight years. I'm 88 years old, and the Lord told him to give it to us, wow. debt-free. 
and, and, and we, so we're honored and blessed to be able to continue that legacy and, and we're humbled too like God there's so many people better qualified than us to, to, to do this but that was what the Lord put on his heart this is the um, the marker stone that's there it's hard to read but it talks about you know this is the place where where the first charismatic revival took place uh, and there's, you can see the little house back here where where, uh, where everything happened where they were gathering and praying together and so the Lord's bringing us boom Boom, and then up to Strawberry Lake, Minnesota. So the, the revival in Murphy started the Church of God denomination. The revival in Azusa started the Pentecost. The Pentecostal. Pentecostal movement. movement. And the uh, revival well in White Earth started the Charismatic movement. And we're like, wow, Father, you're taking us to these wells. These wells. And then uh, two weeks ago... We were at a conference and we're there the whole weekend. And as we're leaving, this elderly couple comes up and start talking to us, and, and we you know, we're just just kind of chit chatting and everything. And, and somehow uh, Azusa came or Gerald Durstein, the Dursteins came up, and that generation knows them. They, they they all know who the Dursteins are. He was an ambassador to Israel for 57 years, and was the only person to successfully bring peace in Jerusalem between the Arabs and the Jews and the Christians. Uh, he thought it was a joke when the when the Israeli Knesset called him and said, the UN has failed, your American government has failed, you're a man of God, will you come and try? And so he just kept outreaching and outreaching and going back year after year. Uh, and so, I mean, he would even have, they had billboards in the Arab sections, like when they went to pick him up, they put a fake beard on him in an Arab turban to disguise him because they had, they had billboards with his face saying, kill this man. I just realized that clock is an hour behind, isn't it? We yeah. need to kind of speed okay. things up. So, so that's the, the future calling that, that the Lord's bringing us to is, is back into full-time ministry. We're, uh, we're going up there. Uh, there's, there's two other families that the Lord has called to come up to the white earth. And one of the dreams, one of the visions is it's only, open, only been open for six years during the summer. You know, and there's guest speakers that come and conferences and things like that. But he's always had a vision of opening it year-round. And, and that's the same thing that the Lord told us. You know, when he said, if I gave you the deed to this place, what would you do with it? And you know, we've been there a few times where we see you know, the local community gets poured into during the conferences, but then the place shuts down. And where do the people go? You know, and there's such hopelessness there. There's no discipleship. And so we're like, we need to do the Matthew 25 mandate yes. from here. You know, take care of the orphans, the widows, do a prison ministry, you know, feed the people, and, and, and just pray for that revival from that gate. The, the area where this is in is also the headwaters of the Mississippi, where people have been praying and pouring anointing oil and blowing shofars and saying, God, we need revival. We need revival here because those waters go throughout the world. I'd like to turn to that and read that real quick, you guys, because and we'll try to make this as brief as we can. But one of the things that the Father has taught me recently, and I feel like an idiot because I didn't get this before. It seems so simple. But um, where, when he said something about um, he, he would return the, the crop, the harvest, tenfold, thirtyfold, or a hundredfold, um, I believe that was the increments, right? I don't have the scripture at hand. But I, I always just kind of wondered, what, what, what would be the difference? You know, what, what makes the difference in that? And just recently he impressed upon me, I mean, I've been gardening all my life and just recently he showed me it depends on how fertile the ground that you're planting the seed in is so when you're talking about when you as a church want to consider where do you want to pour into where do you want to plant for your harvest we we feel like what the Lord, the season that the Lord is maturing us into is being fertile ground for that because this is the mandate that the Lord's given us not only to take care of the widows and the orphans, those are two, but starting in Matthew 25, 34 on, then the king will say to those on his right, okay, he's already placed the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left hand. The king will say to those on his right, come you 
whom my Father has blessed, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you from the founding of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you made me your guest. I needed clothes and you provided them. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the, hung, the people who have done what God wants will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and make you our guest or needing clothes and provide them? When did we see you sick and, or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them, yes, I tell you, whenever you did these things for one of the least important of these brothers of mine, you did them for me. Will you read the rest of that? Then he will also speak to those on his left. Now he's talking to the goats. Get away from me, you who are cursed. Go off into the fire prepared for the adversary and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. Thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. A stranger, and you did not welcome me. Needing clothes, you did not give them to me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then they too will reply, Lord, when do we see you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, needing clothes, sick or in prison, and not take care of you? And he answered, yes. I tell you that whenever you refuse to do it for the least important of these people, you refuse to do it for me. They will go off to the eternal punishment. But those who have done what God wants will go to eternal life. You know, how many of us can say that we can say what Job said? Where Job said, Lord, if, if I pass by, if I ever pass by somebody who was in need and didn't give them something, may my right arm fall off. I mean, that's, that's a pretty strong statement. He didn't make judgments about them. Oh, they might spend it on... On drugs or, or alcohol. It doesn't matter what they're the going to do with the money. What are you doing with yours? You know? And it may be that that person that we would normally say, oh, I can't believe they spent my money going out buying vodka. You know what? Some, did you know that DTs, delirium tremens, can kill somebody if they're far enough along in alcoholism? They might need to last another few days until they can get to a preacher. If, if they don't have that drug, it can kill them. Far be it from me, I don't want my money to go for that kind of stuff. But you guys, that's just a matter of fact. If we can pass by somebody because we don't want them spending our money on their drugs, we could have just killed them. And that's a horrible truth. But as a doctor, I know it to be true. And so I'm not going to make a judgment about that. How That's between them and God. And I just pray that the Lord will carry them through to the place where they need to be, where he can intercept them and change things. And yes, that may not be very fertile ground, but it is righteousness so, on your part. So we see that the biggest difference between the sheep and the goats in this section is benevolence. And and that's, that's the mandate that the Lord has for us up there. Uh, so, oh, so back to uh, South Carolina. So we were talking. Can I wrap this up real fast? Yeah. So all that to say, we can't all be there doing, doing each one of those, but we are a body. We're not all the hand that gives out. Some of us is the other hand that's working for it. Some of us is the other hand, uh, the foot that's traveling there. And so we are going to be in ministry full time and we're coming out of the world and we are going to be a place of fertile ground we want to be able to pass that on to other people. We want to fulfill every one of these things that a sheep does. And so if you are enabling us, just like you would be enabling other people in other ways, if you enable us to be able to do that, that's the only way that we can do it. And so we're saying we, the Lord is removing us from full-time work for the world. We, we can be the laborers. The laborers are few. But the laborers need to be given seed. And so, should the Father lay it in y'all's heart, we believe that white earth is going to be fertile ground, and you should see the dirt there, black as earth. Black. <laughs> like black like that, the soil is that rich, physically. And it's like, wow. So, so, so we were in Spartanburg two weeks ago, and talking to this elderly couple, and just out of the blue, well, we, kind of, we mentioned Murphy, and then he says, you know, the Lord has given me an anointing to dig up ancient wells. And we were just like, so we started telling him about Shearer's schoolhouse and, and everything. And I tell you, when you see an 80 plus year old man crying, because he knows that his inheritance, not just physical, his, 
His grandmother was Cherokee and was one of that first generation from Shearer. And so they're like, we're going. We're going to be there uh, at this outpouring. And it, it's across denominational lines. All, all, all that's being set aside just to come together on an appointed time. It's giving the first fruit. You were talking about the offerings. This is the first fruit of the year. You're giving the first fruit of your time for the whole year to God. And saying, look, we're going to gather together. We're going to leave all these doctrines and traditions of men. We're going to put all that outside because we're all washed by the blood of the Lamb. And we're going to come together at your, your appointed place. And we're just going to cry out for revival. And this is going to be happening all across the country. As 121st nations who are being called to Azusa are going to be leading the prayers for revival in America. This is the great awakening that many have, have prophesied. We just learned about the Smith, Smith Wigglesworth prophesying that yesterday. And we were just blown away. So, we... There we go. Let me put one more. This was, um, this was last year. We went to... That's the house where the Holy Spirit fell uh, upon them. And that's Papa Gerald. Last year, we went up there. Folks, these kids, five, by the time they're nine years old, five, of, five out of six of them have been met, molested and raped. There's no hope. Some of the reservations, uh, last year we had one reservation where 200 kids committed suicide in one month. 200 native kids. And we have prophecies that there's a generation, the seventh generation, that's going to rise up and bring that restoration. And these are the generations. We called a bunch of the boys up, the young men, you know, and at first this was an outreach into the community and bringing these kids in. And these boys had never been held, like, with the love of a father. They, they, they didn't know what that was like. All they know is fists or kicks or, hmm? Yeah, and they'd never been held in a good way. And, and this girl here, you know, Laurel was with the girls. Like they, they don't know what that, that unconditional, pure love of the Messiah is. And this young lady, for like 20 minutes, wouldn't let go of her. Just after weeping and just absorbing that love that's so needed. And then this was at the end, and these were these kids accepting the Lord. And, and as we know, it's so crucial that discipleship comes next. You guys, this yeah. one came in with fingernail polish on, black fingernail polish on, and you could tell he's... The, the emo cutter, um, gender confused person. And at the end, he's sitting there raising his hands, just a huge encounter. I mean, he came in just hardened and I don't know why I'm here kind of thing. And just the walls, that love totally broke down the walls. And that's what the people need. So we want to humbly ask that you help in, in supporting this. And, and we would love to invite you all to come up uh, you know, during the summer we have all sorts of conferences and speakers that come, but Native American Week, it's a whole week of praise and worship, the drums, of people are dressed in our outfits and we're teaching, um, or you can just come to bring your family for a getaway. You know, there's wonderful fishing and all these things, but thank you, brother, for allowing us to come and speak about the gates, uh, about our future calling, but uh, please get a hold of us and I can direct you to the Facebook event page for the revival gathering here in Murphy. You and definitely want to be a part of it, and especially if you have Native American blood, Brother Bobby, I definitely, definitely recommend you be there because genetically you have a blood authority over that land. And it, it, we, we, there's a whole other teaching in Genesis about when God gave the people the borders. Uh, but there's an authority that comes with your people over that land as being the original caretakers of that land. Go ahead, brother, go ahead. Uh, you know, there's more to it.